Hello everyone and welcome to our today's Quanser webinar. My name is Zuzana Fabushova and together with my colleague Peter Martin, R&D Manager of Academic Applications, we will be your hosts and webinar moderators today. Good morning everyone. Thanks for coming today. As Susanna mentioned, today we're going to be talking a little bit about delivering modern and motivational experiences to students um, you, on and off campus using both um, actual hardware and digital uh, resources. So this is going to be a little bit of a, a walk, essentially, through all the things that we've been working on for anywhere from the last three months to the last three years to the last three decades. And uh, what I hope will essentially come out of this is by the time we get to the Q&A session, which I will try to hit pretty early if I can make it, so bear with me, things might get a little bit hectic as I switch between different devices and things like that. But once we get to the end, I hope this will be a good starting point for a, a fruitful conversation in the Q&A in terms of how these resources can be used and leveraged for, for different teaching applications. So with that, we'll get right into it. Um, at Kwanzaa, if you've been to any of our webinars or presentations before, you'll know we always like to start with this slide to talk a little bit about our heritage. As a company, um, our name is derived from the combination of question and answer. We're an academically focused company and a company that's been in the business of creating academic solutions for teaching and research for over 30 years. Um, our systems are used in, it says here, two and a half thousand plus academic institutions globally. I think we're actually probably close to at least one and a half times that number at this point. Um, with thousands of research papers published on the research side using our materials. Um, by the way, Susanna would have you know that you can peruse those papers, um, at least the abstracts on our website, if you're interested in what particular hardware platforms have been used for different research applications that might be relevant to you and your personal interests. Feel free to check that out on our website. And also, our, we have a core of about 80 plus hardware products and solutions. That number is growing. Um, now into the digital realm, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but essentially we've been uh, building everything um, from teaching control systems, products to mechatronics, robotics, and then in the last 10 or 12 years getting into unmanned vehicles and autonomous robotics and self-driving vehicle uh, training systems and all sorts of other um, peripheral and uh, emerging trends in, in the academic space around mechatronics, controls, and robotics. So. Um, out of this, I think the main thing that uh, to take away from these first couple of slides is that we, we've been building these types of experiences for students for a long time, especially on the teaching side. And from that has come um, sort of a, an understanding or an ethos around how we present materials to students and what is important for students to understand and to take away from their experiences using our hardware and using our, our digital ecosystem products so that they can really go off into their later lives, whether it be in teaching and research or in uh, in industry, obviously, and apply those skills they've learned and really understand the the downstream motivation or the downstream application of these different concepts and skills they learn in, at the university level. And that's really where we started and that's where we continue to, to try to innovate, to bring those experiences to students. And really we, what we're trying to do is to answer this fundamental question and to work with our partners and to work with you to, to help really prepare the next generation of engineering leaders. We have, uh, as we all know, a lot of, uh, a lot of problems as a, as a global planet and a lot of uh, challenges that uh, engineers more and more are gonna be called upon to try to address in innovative ways now and I'm sure in the future. And uh, with that comes this question of how do we prepare that generation of engineering leaders? How do we give them the skills that they need to be able to take on those challenges. And uh, what we've done traditionally is essentially we've tried to just bridge the gap between theory and practice. So traditionally in engineering, at least in the last 50 or so years, um, engineering was sort of more of a, a, a traditional science that was based around theoretical abstract com uh, concepts and simulations and a mathematical rigor that is definitely required. It's definitely a very essential part of what engineering is, but at the same time, there's the practice, there's the hands-on applications of how students take those theoretical skills and apply them to applications. And that's really where we've lived for a long time as a company is trying to bring those theoretical concepts to life and to let students see and touch and interact with those concepts. 
and uh, so we also see it to a certain extent as a cycle where from the application they may notice a phenomenon or, no, or notice a behavior and want to know where that came from why that didn't match the concept that they would be familiar with the the one i classically go to is when i was teaching with our founder at the university of toronto in uh an advanced controls course this was a, a first year graduate controls course uh, most of our students were taking a master's of engineering and control systems and none of them had ever applied a control system on actual hardware ever this is five years of, of ostensibly control systems um, experience. And so when we gave them these hands-on experiences, showed them the applications and how these theoretical concepts came to life, their first reaction, and I have emails that show this, was the hardware is broken because it doesn't work the way that our models say it worked. It, does, it isn't doing what it's supposed to do. And from that comes this revelation of that's not how hardware works. Like when you actually take a control system and do something with it in the real world, it's not going to behave the way that you think it should. But then you can take those experiences back to the theory and make your models better and make your algorithms more highly tuned or more flexible or, and that really out of that understanding comes a much broader, a much more applicable understanding of how control systems lives in the real world. And then more recently, We've taken those lessons and we've started to conceptualize in order to embrace sort of modern emerging trends, like I said, in more integrated systems and more complex system level understanding that's required for modern engineering, this concept of a, a complex modern system. And from this complex modern system, um, what we've basically done is abstract our physical systems or any real physical system that has complexity that you would see in the real world or that you would interact with in a laboratory to this combination of sensing, actuation, communication, and computation, what we like to, to humorously call see, chat, do, and think. And these are the essential parts of these complex systems and also the essential parts of an understanding of uh, mechatronics and robotics and control systems in terms of how these different elements of modern complex systems come together and how they can be used to, in our curriculum, give students a common framework for connecting different courses and projects and types of hardware to let um, us ourselves define learning outcomes, but also to map these complex applications to real world applications. And again, that's to us, that's where the motivation comes from. The motivation to us as educators, as I said, comes from trying to equip them with the skills they need, but fundamentally we see the motivation to students coming from the application, coming from how well, what we sort of jokingly like to call like, when am I ever going to use this? And that's a question we really try to answer every time we make a piece of curriculum. I'm going to show you a lot of our curriculum today. And whether it's our mobile textbook or our lab activities that I'm going to show you that we've been working on for the last couple of months, or even our traditional material, we always start with that motivation. We start with that question of when am I ever going to use this? What is the point of learning about this concept? And from that, especially from those exciting applications I showed a minute ago, that's where the students see the motivation and get their, their interest in how they can learn these systems and apply these systems. And to do that, it's important to be able to abstract away the, the nitty gritty of the, the integration task and really show them the different elements and how they can be recombined. And I'll show you that in a second. But first, I'm gonna introduce you to the Cube Servo 2. A lot of you may be familiar with the Cube Servo 2. It's uh, one of our most ubiquitous plants. Um, the one thing I'll mention just in passing as we get to the, the system level concept that I just talked about a second ago is that, um, just as a little aside, we just introduced, um, or we will be introducing in the next couple of months, we just made um, public, and you can contact us if you're interested, a new slew of labs for the Cube Servo 2. We now have, I think, almost double the lab activities that we had previously for the Cube Servo 2. So you can see, I think before we had somewhere in the order of 12 or, or 13 lab activities, we now have close to 30 for the Cube Servo 2. These are all completely open, completely modifiable, flexible, completely free. And uh, they cover, as you can see, pretty much every concept you would want to cover in control systems in a hands-on way. Um, so if you're interested in that, please let us know. This is just a little aside to, first of all, introduce the Cube Servo, but also to introduce um, the latest and, and most exciting news we have on the Cube Servo front. But to get really quickly back to this system level survey and the system level understanding of how we integrate complexity and try to show students 
how they can take something as simple as a cube servo and make it motivational and interesting. I'll talk a little bit about how our cube servos have been used by in different application areas by different uh, research and teaching applications. And you can see here that whether it's dynamic control or prototyping or vision or even emerging trends like IoT and cybersecurity and machine learning and things like that, the, the, the humble cube servo can be used for all of these things. And from that, students can see that even if it's just a DC motor with a sensor and some dynamic complexity with amplification and, and real-time control and everything else that we surround our systems with, the applications are endless. And the ways that you can show I mean, some of these are obviously not real world applications. I don't think anyone is going to invert a pendulum and dance in front of it doing um, body tracking to be able to, to show how that is applied to a real world context. But in terms of integration, in terms of taking complexity and looking at the different elements of it and seeing how it can be fitted together in terms of communication and processing and perception, those are all really exciting and really interesting, motivational, and also really important things for students to understand and important skills for them to take to those downstream um, applications, whether it, as I said, be in research or industry or wherever else they find themselves in the future. So the one thing I'm going to do now to sort of introduce the idea of how you could talk about this, um, as I said, as part of this, this concept in your, uh, your teaching or in your presentations to students, whether it be on campus or online, is I'm just going to flip away from my slides for one second. I'm going to show my camera. There we go. Should pop up in a second here. There you go. That's me. Hello. And here I have a cube servo. And uh, I'll just exit out of my slides for a second and bring up MATLAB. And what I'm going to show you is basically the type of presentation you could give students really easily, whether it's at home and you're doing a screen share with your students or you're even on campus in a lecture hall or wherever you find yourself, this is a very easy type of presentation to give. The first thing I'll do is, and I'm going to introduce this next, so stay tuned. I'm going to open up a presentation on PID control that I got for free from the instructor resources for our textbook experience controls. And I'll talk a little bit more about experience controls in a second, but we have um, there'll be a slide on a little bit later and I forget the actual numbers, but somewhere on the order of two or 300 um, slides and uh, assessment questions and examples and documentation for instructors um, based around our textbook. This is, as you can see, it's pretty open and naked in terms of the, the formatting of the presentation because we expect you to be able to put your own flavor and your own spin and formatting on it, but it covers all the essentials of classic PID control, Again, starting with motivation, talking about where position control is used, where speed control is used, why you would use these types of approaches, things like that, getting into the common background sections around control systems and how they're structured and how proportional control affects systems and different responses and things like that. Again, this is all completely free for you to use. You just have to sign up on our website and I'll give you a link to that a little bit later. Um, but the thing is, let's. Um, just for a second, talk about something with like PD control. You can see here the classic presentation that you would give where you're saying you have a response with proportional control and you want to introduce a derivative action to reduce overshoot to basically add damping to your system. But this is basically the, the level of complexity and the level of understanding students might get to, depending on how it's presented in terms of being able to see the difference between lots of oscillations and not that many oscillations and how that affects the motor voltage. But very easily, I could also just open up a Simulink model. This is also just from our free curriculum. And I can connect to my model that's running on my system here. You can see I ran it a little bit earlier, but I'll run it again. Um, they can see the, the cube servo here on my desk. It'll just take a second to, to connect to my real-time code. And then give that a run. And they can see immediately how with a, a nicely tuned system, I don't have a lot of overshoot. They can see how my system model, my theoretical model, compares to my actual system. And we can talk a little bit about how actual systems have different unmeasured um, nonlinearities like viscous friction and things like that that can influence the response that you actually see. You can see I have some steady state error in my actual system because ideally, you can see I wouldn't, but ideal world is not the theoretical world as we talked about earlier. But then if I do something in order to, again, illustrate 
conceptually how damping works, I can just get rid of my damping and I'll try this again. You could run this continuously and just tune all these parameters on the fly, but because this is only running for a few seconds, I'll have to, uh, to run it again. And what they'll be able to see here is again, in actual hardware actually sitting here working with this system, how your response is affected and how looking again from what I just saw, obviously there's quite a lot more <laughs> oscillation now. Maybe I do need a little bit of velocity gain, um, but you can talk a little bit about how these, these types of phenomenon work and how that's the sort of thing that you're really gonna need if you're going to, depending on your sample rate and depending on how you apply this. And you can go into those details. You can change the sample rates. You can add a little bit more velocity gain. You can add filtering on your feedback. You can change it from what we're doing here with velocity feedback to just your classic PID structure and show all the differences and show how it works. And you can actually have students work with these systems themselves, which I'll, t I'll show you in just a couple of minutes in terms of how you can actually give them this type of experience as you're showing it to them. And they can do comparisons there as well. But the first thing I'll do um, is I'll talk a little bit more about experience controls as I just talked about with the instructor resources, where how do you, what we wanted to do at the end of last year, or sorry, I should say the beginning of last year, we launched at the end of last year, was to, to try to bring this kind of flavor and bring this kind of, um, this kind of ethos, as I said earlier, about how control systems and how mechatronics and robotics are, are applied in the real world to students as they tackle what is typically sort of one of the more difficult um, areas of a control systems course to be able to have students feel motivated about, which is the textbook. And so what we did was we basically took our, our years of um, experience in building digital platforms for mobile, and we created a completely mobile textbook. And uh, as you can see, we started with the fundamental um, core tenet of everything should be motivational. It should have applications that are relevant to real world applications, and it should be interesting and interactive and engaging. And so you can see here, they can interact with all these simulations. They can try all sorts of different control parameters and structures and approaches to all sorts of different plants, whether it's submarines or rocket ships or airplanes or even just traditional industry things like robotic arms and couple tank systems and things like that. And uh, we really feel like this is one of the, the most rich and exciting um, ways to be able to have a resource and a reference like a textbook um, to be able to understand and really connect with these concepts, even if it's just a plot. The one I'd love to show, which I can actually show you in a second here, I'll, I'll share my screen and you can take a look at it, is something as simple as just being able to show students the uh, the effective aliasing, which, I mean, on its, on its face doesn't sound that exciting. Aliasing is not exactly, um, I'm just connecting my phone here, is not that exciting a thing to be able to like talk to students about. But uh, if you look at this sort of um, application here, I'll bring it up. And uh, you can see I was going through some stuff earlier, but if I come here to data acquisition, so again, data acquisition, it's a pretty straightforward concept. We typically maybe don't even cover it in control systems, but again, we think it's important for students to understand where the data they're gonna use in their controller comes from. We talk about different types of processors, different types of DAC systems, things like that. We always highlight the basics. And as you can see here, we always start again with the motivation. What, why are you gonna learn about DAX? What's the, the downstream um, reason to learn about these concepts? A little bit of types of signals, things like that. But very quickly, you get into something that's interactive where I'm just playing with the sample rate being applied to a simple sine wave and seeing how the sample rate affects the quality of the outcome. The, the aliasing on the outcome. And you can see here, if I change my frequency, again, I run into issues unless I have to up my sample rate and you can get into Nyquist and things like that. So there's a lot of complexity here, but this is the first time when, when one of our developers created this, this is the first time it ever really seen an interaction like this to really show a student how something like aliasing comes to life and how you lose in resolution as you change sample rate and you change analog frequency. And we do this the same thing with digital systems and things like that. And you can change the types of signals and all sorts of stuff like that. But even something as simple as this, it doesn't have to be as complex as, again, if we get back to something like the, the PID control example I was showing earlier, we, we you can do something like this to show students the the applications for how something like this would come together where you run a simulation and you can show them 
how simulations can come together and how interacting with something in the real world can uh, can really make it exciting for them. But it doesn't have to be something like a, a tank system or a robot arm to show them an application. It can just be an interaction of something that you would typically see in a textbook, but it's coming to life. It's interactive and it's something that they can see and play with. And that becomes really interesting a lot of times. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that, again, just to reinforce the concepts I've been talking about, what we've done with the textbook is also given a remote hardware experience where students, just for a couple of minutes, just to see what happens, can remotely connect to a cube servo that we've set up at our office and they can play with these actual games on a cube servo remotely. It's not essentially a, ro a remote lab because they only have a couple of minutes and it's only tuning a couple of parameters on it, but it's on an actual piece of hardware so they can actually see how again, the, the damping coefficient affects the position controller, or if you flip to, to speed control, how speed control works and how, as you can see here, I'm getting a little bit of noise now. And if I increase my derivative, maybe I'll get a much smoother response. But as you can see, derivatives increase noise again. So I have to mitigate that by controlling my derivative a little bit more to try to reduce noise, but then I can introduce integrals. And you can see how students just playing with this for a couple of minutes can start to really understand how these parameters that they've been learning about can affect a real piece of hardware. And again, it's just a really simple interaction. And I will talk a little bit later on, if you like, about um, some applications of, of remote access to hardware and things like that. But really what I wanted to showcase here was how you can make something like a textbook interactive and motivational and interesting to students. It doesn't have to be as, as plain and as straightforward as it typically would be. Um, here again, as you can see, the our application of position control, where we're actually just working with an arm, and you can see, you can tune your parameters and see how that affects the degree of freedom of the arm. You can introduce noise and see how noise affects the response, and then you can introduce filtering and see how filtering, while reducing the noise, also introduces some lag and makes it a little bit unstable, and you have to retune. So you can really get an understanding of how these types of systems work and how they're applied. So the next thing that I think we'll jump to now, I'm just going to close this, is just to talk a little bit about where we've come with this platform. So this was launched last fall. And all I wanna basically say around here is that if you adopt something like this, you're not alone. We have a large pool of partners we've been working with on this platform for many years. We have at this point over 400 instructor downloads. Most of those instructors have joined our dedicated newsletter for this platform where we share some thoughts on pedagogy and on teaching and some ideas for how these types of systems can be used, sort of like this presentation we're giving right now. It's It's been downloaded by over three and a half thousand students just since last September, so just in the, the last academic year. Um, we have 60 curriculum modules at this point, like I said, 300 pages of instructor resources with 250 slides. And as you can see, the response of students is fantastic. I think we've only, we've only ever got one three-star review and every other review we've gotten out of, I think one or 200 reviews has been five, four or five stars with a lot of really, <laughs> really nice feedback from students who um, really make for us developing something like this motivational but also that shows that students really do want to connect with these concepts and they want to understand them and really get a feel for how they work and they appreciate this type of platform in order to try to make things more interesting and exciting and engaging for them so moving a little bit forward now we've talked a little bit about textbooks we've talked a little bit about how you can use our hardware in lecture contexts and things like that this year has been a little bit different obviously and obviously a lot of how we've we've approached the problems of, like I said earlier, trying to give students the skills they need to be successful in the future and to be engineering leaders. That's difficult when you're not on campus, when you can't be, sort of be with students and actually tell them how these systems work and show them things and work one-on-one, -on -one, whether it being during lab hours or during lectures or, or tutorials and things like that. It, it's, it's difficult remotely, there's a distance. I mean, the, I'm, I'm giving a webinar right now from my bedroom. This is not typically how we would do this type of interaction. So everyone is, it has, has this issue this year and everyone has been trying to come to it in different ways. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've solved, not necessarily solved, but how we've tried to provide uh, a number of solutions this year to be, be able to make this experience better and to be able to continue to allow our partners to deliver these experiences for students that can make them those leaders not to have to compromise on 
their teaching objectives around the quality of their education to really even try to make it better than it was in the past to try to make it more motivational and make it more modern and really give students a better experience at a distance than they maybe traditionally did on campus. Um, but we've got a lot of these emails essentially is what I wanted to say with this slide. But this was a problem that wasn't one that we were isolated from as you can imagine. And so earliest, earlier this year um, at breakneck speed, uh, we tried to develop a way by leveraging the mobile platform I just showed you and a lot of our past experience with um, virtual reality and virtual environments that we've been using for a number of products over the years to try to bring these experiences off campus. And so what we did was we basically have developed what we call interactive labs. As you can see here, it's compatible with Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android. It has mobile experiences. It has desktop experiences. That was one thing that was really important to us was to be able to have their, these experiences be available anywhere to anyone. So it doesn't matter if you have a Mac or you have a relatively um, basic Windows machine or just your phone, whether it's an Android phone or an iOS phone, you can have these experiences and get the same types of simulations, the same types of interactions and, and the same types of experiences as you typically would when you're sitting in front of, uh, in front of this hardware in a lecture hall. Excuse me. And so uh, I think what I'm just going to do is, again, jump right into showing you how the, this system works. I'm going to start with mobile. Um, so I'll just show a little bit about the mobile experience. And then from there, we'll, we'll get back into uh, showing the desktop experience. And so I'm just going to start up Q Labs. This is a free trial that's available right now. You can go to the website, quantum.com slash interactive labs. I'll show you the website later on. And you can download the Windows versions from anyone's phone at any point right now on iOS or Android. You can download a free trial on the App Store. Um, as of July 1st, it'll be basically a, a subscription service. So we'll be, we'll be pivoting to subscriptions that can be institutional or they can be individual. And uh, from there on, we're only going to grow the platform. We have a lot of content coming in order to build out the lab experiences. And we have a lot of other really exciting things coming too that I'll talk about in a little bit. But Right now, you can try this yourself as you watch and uh, and see what you think. And so I'm just going to really quickly get back to position control. We just showed position control. We just talked about it quite a while in terms of hardware and in terms of experience control. So let's talk about it again, but now in the context of the laboratories. Now we're trying to to apply the skills, like I showed you on the real hardware, on a plant to understand um, how position control works. And so. Again, we're starting with motivation. We're talking about position control, how position control is used, go through some key concepts in terms of some of the elements of position control and how it comes together. But if I go to the next page, um, now we're in the lab. So now we have our lab procedure as you traditionally would. We start with our, our fundamental transfer function we always talk about. Um, you can see here, if, you, if I say show position control, there's some check your understanding questions. So this is the procedure I'm going through to be able to do the lab activity. But in this procedure, I can check my understanding of these concepts to make sure that I'm ready for these things. And you can see here, I answered that wrong. I didn't actually even read the question, but um, this will give me an understanding of whether or not I'm, I know what's going on as I move through the material and I can try to reinforce my answers and really connect with the material. But all this is going to be done on my cube servo. So there's a cube servo. It looks sort of like the one you just saw on camera. And as much as we possibly could make it, it behaves like the one that you just saw on camera. You can see here, I can tune my gains again, and I can see how the responses change. I can increase my damping, and I can see how that affects it. And so I can basically interact the same way that you just saw me interacting with the real hardware. But in this case, it's on a represent representational piece of hardware. Um, in terms of the technology here, this is running on the same platform. The other experiences I showed you with experience controls and our other platforms work, but this is our in-house developed platform. We spent seven years developing it. It does, we have our own solvers, our own simulation environment. It runs at, in reasonable real time on most devices. And you can see here that it gives us the ability to create these simulations and really show how this type of complexity and this type of system is affected by different parameters and different tuning environments and things like that. Um, but the one thing that's interesting is you can see here, if you look at the bottom, 
I'm running this on a modeled version of the hardware. I'm not actually running it on the real hardware in, in quotation marks. And so this isn't really acting necessarily the way that that real hardware I showed you would have acted. As you can see here, like we had before, we have no steady state error because the model doesn't expect it. But if I flip to actual, we're now we're actually introducing some of those nonlinear elements, some of those real hardware elements and showing how you do get steady state error, you do get a little bit more overshoot and things like that. And so they can understand the same thing I talked about that we used to talk about at the University of Toronto. They can understand the same thing that you can show in your lectures. They understand that difference, that fundamental difference between the theory and the practical application. And so that was the really important thing we always wanted to bring to this. And whether it's on the Aero or the other platforms that we're going to be bringing to this in a, in a couple of months in terms of the um, the pendulum system and things like that. It's always that fundamental level of understanding of how the theory works and the practical applications can be affected and things like that. Um, with that, I'm just really quickly going to flip actually to a different computer just to show you the desktop environment. So just bear with me for one second. I'm gonna flip over to a different system. There we go. All right, so this is what the desktop environment looks like. As you can see, it's kind of the same menu structure as you saw on mobile. Um, we have the same labs that you had on mobile. But if I go back to the position control lab, now you can see it's a much richer environment. This is a full custom developed virtual environment that we've made using Unreal Engine. And as you can see, I have the same interface I had before with my plot, my model, and actual, my tuning parameters. But now you can see this is basically the next best thing to sitting in front of the actual hardware. I, as you can see, my response is the same as it was before in terms of showing um, no steady state error and the same types of effects as I had before. But again, I can flip to the actual model and I can immediately see the difference and understand how this real piece of hardware is being affected by changing parameters and tuning and things like that. Um, you can see we even have a little bit of the, the steady state error, the, the lights turn on and off, like the, everything behaves as much as possible, like I said, the way that we would like it to behave um, in the actual system. You can see here, especially with the arrow, it starts to become really exciting how you can see the system work and how you can understand the, the dynamics and couple dynamics of an aerospace system and things like that um, in terms of being able to see the way that it moves and behaves. And if you were then to use this alongside something like the Experience Controls textbook, where we have the remote hardware experience for Aero as well, you could actually look at both of them and you could actually see how the two interplay and how the actual hardware looks like this hardware and behaves sort of like this hardware because this lab experience is very similar to the one that you can have with that platform. And so bringing all of these things together, you can we really truly believe that you can have lab experiences off campus very in a very similar way in terms of the outcomes that you're motive, that you're trying to motivate students to understand in terms of the way that they see and understand and um, take away these experiences from the hardware. And on campus, like this isn't a platform we've only developed for this particular situation we're all in right now. In the future, we we don't see this platform going away. This is a platform that we've invested in. It's one that we're building out to be a really effective platform in the future. And it's one that we really want to make uh, a part of what we do as a company. And from that, we really see this type of platform as being hugely beneficial on campus, where if you then combine those sorts of experiences I just showed you with traditional lab activities, with um, our textbook activities or other resources or other interactions, you can really give students a rich experience where they can work with real hardware, they can work with different types of hardware, they can work at home, they can do flip classrooms, they can do projects, they can do all sorts of exciting things. And it makes, and in this particular case, one of our main motivators was to deliver this as quickly as possible, obviously, but also to make the the implementation as simple as possible in terms of this requires no IT support, no prior setup, no infrastructure, nothing. It, you can just basically give a license to your students and they can use it the next 10 minutes from then, not even the next day. And uh, that was really essential. But again, this can only scale and it can only be used in different ways and exciting ways. And you can use this in all sorts of different applications in lectures or in, in laboratory experiences for students and things like that. So it has a lot of 
potential, not just as a, a measure right now to give students lab experiences while they may not be able to be on campus to get them the way they normally would. Just to quickly touch on the curriculum we're gonna be offering on this platform. Um, as you saw at the moment, we do modeling, position control, and speed control as part of the free trial, as well as the some of the arrow concepts. We're gonna be more than doubling that by the July to add more of that material I showed you that we have for Cube Servo 2. But this is all custom developed for the platform. It's custom developed to give students a really focused experience on having those outcomes and having those, those what we call aha moments of really uh, sort of like understanding how hardware works, understanding how control systems works. And then for the Aero platform, we'll be adding another complementary lab talking about our half quadcopter um, orientation to get a little bit more into the complexity of uh, coupled control systems and optimal control and things like that. So there's a lot to come on that platform. I'm really excited about it and the potential for what we can do with it. And uh, the last thing I'll mention on that platform before um, I think I'll take a little break and we can start doing a little bit of um, questions and I can, I'm can i more than happy to show some other examples of things is on July 1st as well, we're gonna be releasing QLab's virtual robotics. Um, this is an example of the QArm, which is an unreleased product. We're actually gonna be releasing it for the first time digitally <laughs> and then later this fall in, in actuality. Um, and this will also be complemented by our traditional Qbot 2e platform, which I'll show in a second. And uh, the take on virtual um, in terms of Qlab's virtual products, so this is virtu Qlab's virtual robotics. Later on this year, we'll also release Qlab's virtual controls. The take here is slightly different. You may One of the m main questions we get because of who we are as a company, and what we've done over the last 30 years is interactive labs is great. It's great for students to really quickly work with hardware and understand the fundamentals of, of hardware and how it works and how control systems are applied and how changing parameters and and playing with control parameters and, and tuning gains and filters and things like that affects control systems and as a complement to something like experience controls it really gives them a rich understanding of the basics of control but what we've always done as a company and especially for research or more advanced control applications or projects or things like that those icons on the top are important being able to work with MATLAB and Simulink and Python and C++ and the other environments where, where people build their controllers. That's a huge part of control systems and an even bigger, I would say, part of robotics, where if you're going to design an algorithm for image processing or path planning or localization and obstacle avoidance, you need to be able to create that algorithm. You need to be able to understand the code and how it affects this type of, as I said earlier, complex integrated system. And so, for the robotics package first and then later this year for the controls package we've coined this virtual platform concept where it behaves sort of like the windows version i showed you with the cube servo 2 and uh, the arrow but it also behaves almost exactly like our hardware does from an interfacing point of view so the concept will be you start up that platform i just showed you the interactive labs windows client and uh if you have the um, purchase of subscription to virtual robotics, you'll be able to open the QRM. As you can see on the left here, this is actually an image from the current environment we're building for it. And you'll be able to then connect to it with your existing code. Um, almost for our tenant for this will be any of our existing curriculum where it will almost turnkey connect to these platforms. But any of your existing code um, from MATLAB Simulink using our Quark platform, but then also from Python and C++ using our APIs, talk to that virtual hardware, exactly the same way you would talk to our real hardware. So in this particular case, if I was going to talk to this from MATLAB Simulink, as I showed you before, um, and I was using Quark, and uh, our concept at the moment is that we will actually be, re be releasing a completely free new version of Quark to go along with this for MATLAB Simulink users that will let them connect to this hardware and use these um, virtual devices with their code completely for free. Um, I will then be able to run that code and just by changing a couple of parameters in my hardware initialization blocks, just use the same code and have the same experience as you would if you were using the actual hardware. Um, the reason I'm showing this um, right-hand side curriculum overview is that We've never released curriculum for QRM either because it's an unreleased product. So this was just a little sneak peek at the curriculum topics that we're gonna be covering um, for this product as well. And some of the really exciting and uh, again, motivational and interactive things we wanna do. As you can see, our ultimate goal for this is to actually have 
um, probably by the, the fall timeframe, an experience where students have this arm, not just on the table, as you can see here, where they're working with it like the real hardware, but actually in a factory environment where they're picking and placing objects from conveyor belts and identifying them using our camera system and doing sorting tasks and things like that as the ultimate motivational goal for students to work towards where, especially with integrated robotic systems like this, we always try to start with the exciting downstream application of what you do with this hardware is doing really interesting, exciting things and then work backwards to break apart the system levels and understand the the sub components and the sub sub components and the interfacing layer and the system layer and things like that. So they can actually see how all of these different elements you can see on the right hand side come together. And so we're going to be building up all of that over the next couple of months. This will um, be released by July 1st. I can give you a sneak peek at sort of what the the uh, the Qbot 2 will look like. This is from a previous video system that we did using the same technology. And uh, you'll see in a second here sort of what the Qbot 2 will look like. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a, a render of what the Qbot 2 looked like looks like currently. But this sort of experience where you'll be able to drive the Qbot around in a known environment, you'll be able to do mapping and localization and all the activities you can currently do with our Qbot curriculum out of the box from image processing to obstacle avoidance and everything else that you would you would typically do. So that's coming as well um, by July 1st. And then beyond that, we have a lot of other exciting things to, to share and that we're working on that we really think will build out a rich um, complement of experiences for students and for you, whether you're teaching in the lab or teaching remotely, and whether you're doing robotics or mechatronics or control systems and you're doing research or you're doing teaching applications or lectures or labs or projects or flipped classrooms, whatever your application and whatever your need, um, we're trying to build out solutions as we always have to, to try to make that possible. And like I said, to try to motivate students and give them those skills that they're going to need regardless, regardless of the situation. So that's about all I have for today. Um, we'd love to, to have you visit our website at uh, kwanzaa.com slash interactive labs or email us info at kwanzaa.com. Um, we also have other websites for experience controls where you can download the instructor material that I showed. Um, interactive labs, as I said, right now is available for free until July 1st on all the platforms. Um, Windows and Mac OS you can download from our website. Mobile apps you can download from the app stores. And obviously our hardware continues to be manufactured. So if you're interested in our hardware, also reach out to us, info at kwanzaa.com, and we'd love to talk to you about your particular needs and what you're interested in uh, in doing with it. And with that, I think we'll we'll flip to a little bit of Q&A if, uh, if anyone has any questions or, or things they'd like to share. Thank you, Peter. Um, yes, we have received a couple of questions, and I would like to invite uh, our whole audience. If you have more questions, please send them now, and Pete will uh, keep answering them as they are coming. Uh, so the first question uh, regarding Quanser Interactive Labs for servo position control. Can I change the reference signal to step input or another type of input? And also, can I change the scale of the position axis? The scale of the axis, for sure. Absolutely. And we're working on more uh, plotting tools in the future that, to make that a really interactive plotting system. Um, this, you can change the scale of the step. And that's one of the things that we um, actually, for position control, now that you mention it, I'm not entirely sure if we can change the scale the step, we might just have it fixed. But definitely for the modeling lab, um, you can change the scale of the of the pitch. I, I can just actually flip to it again. Um, and I can show you. So I'll just flip back to it here. Um, so for position control, what we were trying to get students to understand was, as I said, that difference between the modeled and actual system and how their tuning parameters change depending on the actual system. So if I create my response again, I'll, I should be able to, as you can see here, once it stopped, I can zoom in on different aspects of it and I can inspect the overshoot and things like that. But um, we, we weren't really changing the tuning parameters because we wanted to keep something fixed but be able to give them those outcomes. On the modeling side, you can change the amplitude because for the modeling amplitude, it was important for us again to see, as you can see, my simulated system doesn't necessarily match my actual system. 
I'm pretty familiar with this plant, so I know that if I bump up my gain a little bit and my time constant a little bit, I should get much closer to the actual system. But then we wanted them to, to really know that once you have your system tuned and once you're like, okay, great, I know what my system, um, how my system matches the actual hardware, I'm right around the values that I should be at to be able to have them match perfectly. There, done, I have my system. Once you double or triple the step amplitude, they don't match anymore necessarily because the way that uh, the friction works changes. And so we wanted them to understand that difference and understand that that step amplitude will affect it. Um, but that being said, Again, we had to put limits somewhere because we wanted to deliver this quickly. We wanted to have a focused experience for students and things like that. So um, there, there are limitations in terms of the types of controllers we've implemented in terms of the way that you can you can change the parameters and, and change how those uh, controllers are delivered. But again, that's why we're offering the, the virtual experience in the fall uh, and actually, there's one version of the license that we're going to be providing um, by July 1st for interactive labs con for QLabs controls, where you actually have uh, early access um, to the open versions of the hardware, to the virtual controls platforms, where you can essentially do whatever you like, anything you want to do in Python or Simulink or anything else, it's, it's completely up to you. So as part of the premium op offering for um, QLabs controls, that's available. Otherwise, it's uh, the systems are, are, are relatively focused in terms of what we want students to, to observe as part of the outcomes. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, are the simulation data produced by the models in interactive labs available in other environments like MATLAB Simulink? Um, they will be. We're working on that. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a backlog between um, hitting our release date for early July and being able to provide that functionality, but it's very high on the to-do list. Um, what we're going to do is on the Windows side and the Mac OS side have the ability to download a CSV of the simulation run or um, either of the simulation run or of the, the plot view. We're not entirely sure which, but you'll be able to download a, a CSV of the data and you'll be able to use that to, along with the open Word documents that are provided as part of the, the platform to be able to uh, deliver lab reports and answer questions and do analysis in MATLAB and Excel and things like that. On the mobile side, we're actually going to try to create an entire reporting um, option where students can basically gather up all the questions that they answered in as part of the check your understanding questions, what I didn't show you was as, as part of the labs, there's also the long form assessment questions. We're gonna open that up on the mobile side so they can actually answer those questions in the app. And then all that material can get packaged up and emailed to an instructor or to a TA. So, and also obviously um, gathering up any of the saved data from the plots as well. So we're, we're building out that option on mobile. It's gonna take a little bit of time to get that together. And we're also gonna have that option on Windows as well. So yes, you'll be able to export the simulation runs. For sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we customize uh, the platform as per customer curriculum? Um, so there is an option, again, with the premier version of QLabs controls, um, you, not just of offering, as I said, the, the open versions that you can connect to as well, but also as part of the premium offering, we do give um, customers the ability to have us customize the experience and the curriculum for them. Um, we limit that customization slightly in terms of being able to um, completely change the simulations or add completely new modules or things like that. But what you could do, for instance, is change some of the topics that are covered, change the, the curriculum, change some of the wording. You can customize it to look and feel um, using your university colors or logos or things like that. You could add questions like a student survey or even some additional curriculum questions. and as part of the, the, the package, you also have um, analytics that are built into our portal system where you can see how students are using the modules and how they're answering questions on mobile and things like that. So at least on the mobile side, customization of that curriculum would also include being able to track those solutions and things like that as well. On the Windows side, it's more challenging because the curriculum isn't built in. We just provide it as Word documents. But on the mobile side, you'd be able to track those, those questions and answers and solutions and things like that as well. 
Um, thank you. Uh, we have a question from a professor of biomedical engineering who would like to adapt his physiological control system courses using Quancer. Would that be an option? And maybe you can also comment if there are any plans on um, introducing other systems into QLabs. Yeah, that's a great question. So, and, and as you can imagine, that's a question we get a lot. So, again, in the interest of developing and releasing this platform as quickly as we possibly could, and to give you an, an example, what I showed you in terms of Quanzer Interactive Labs as it stands right now with QLabs Controls, the, the free trial, that was developed in about five weeks, probably less than that. So it, at that breakneck speed with the size of engineering team we have, which is not very large, um, obviously we had to focus on what we know and what we really understand, and that's our hardware products and our end control systems. Um, beyond that, we are expanding out um, to cover, as I said, the, the more open applications and also a more diverse range of our hardware. Um, we're working with some university partners here in Canada to develop a package we're gonna be probably calling something like uh, QLabs or a Kwanzaa Virtual Studio. And uh, that's also slated for the fall timeframe and that will be a much broader complement of our hardware, including things like couple tank systems and uh, more interchangeable rotary platforms with flexible link systems and um, things like that. Um, but at the moment, we're focused primarily on our hardware because we understand it. We can model it really well. We know exactly how it behaves, and we can um, test it at nauseum against the actual hardware um, to make sure that everything works exactly the way we want it to work. For other experiences and other types of application areas, if they can be ported and mapped to our hardware, as I think you're suggesting, then absolutely. Um, we'd love to work with you, and we're going to be releasing over the fall more and more platforms that might get closer to those types of applications. Um, I mean, we're always open to, to partnerships as well. Um, but really in terms of um, the core of what we're gonna be building out, we have talked about um, the possibility of doing other types of systems that aren't directly mapped to our hardware that we manufacture, but it's, it gets very difficult because it's very difficult for us to understand it and to really know how it works and be able to create something that has the right experience for, for our customers. But um, we're definitely working on expanding the offering and expanding into other application areas, definitely things um, on the near horizon, like obviously what we do as a company in terms of um, autonomous vehicles and things like that, but also getting into chemical engineering and uh, some elements that are outside of our, our traditional uh, complement of courses. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a bunch of questions uh, touching on remote lab. So how can we conduct online experiments using Quanser? Can we connect external hardware? And also um, if there are any plans to expand the uh, offering to remote labs so that um, you can control, let's say the, the cube servo and uh, use a video camera to observe it. Right, um, so that's an interesting, a question and one that obviously you can imagine we get quite a lot, especially nowadays. Um, one thing I'll, I'll point you to is um, I did do, um, sorry, we have a number of resources here on our website talking about remote labs. Um, this one talking a little bit more about interactive labs, but if you come down to actually be, before the current crisis hit, um, I did a, a session or a blog and also there's a recorded webinar uh, specifically on remote laboratory experiences that was designed um, as part of our experience controls um, family of uh, webinars and newsletters. And this talks about um, my view of remote lab technology. I've been doing remote labs almost my entire career. And uh, this just talks a little bit about some of the considerations for remote labs and some of the ways that you can build out remote lab experiences using things like I showed you in terms of our, our experiences, but also some of the key elements of remote lab technology. Um, and if you watch the webinar, you'll get a little bit more um, in depth in terms of the, the technologies and the protocols and the important things to consider and stuff like that. Um, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is that the reason that we didn't go in a remote labs direction ourselves is because remote labs are not easy. They're, they're never easy. Like you can build them and I have several times, but 
they never work exactly the way that you'd like them to. And it's they're difficult to maintain. They're difficult to set up, especially in the university context. They have a lot of uh, maintenance and oversight. And you really have to consider the experience you want students to have, whether it's real time or it's asynchronous or they're tuning parameters or they have live camera feeds or they have audio or they have live interaction with TAs, like all of that and scheduling and everything else. It, it gets very tricky. And uh, again, we, we went the virtual route as you've seen with Interactive Labs because we wanted to sidestep all of that and give them those experiences that are very much like what they would have remotely, but without actually having to have all of the infrastructure and maintenance and oversight required for a remote experience. Um, that being said, all of our hardware um, to a certain extent is remote capable. So almost everything, at least if you have um, Quark and MATLAB Simulink as the platform that you use to run our hardware, um, the same way that we deploy Simulink code to our drones and our ground vehicles. You can deploy Simulink code from anywhere through an IP address directly to the hardware, depending on the interface you're using, or even directly to a PC running the hardware. Um, if you look at the, the experience we have right now with experience controls with the remote hardware labs, those for the first few months of experience controls were running on Raspberry Pis. And I would just basically connect directly from anyone's phone to the Raspberry Pi itself, and that would talk via our QFlex platform to the CubeServo 2 into the Arrow. Uh, recently for, <laughs> as I said, for robustness and maintainability, um, especially not being in the office, I transitioned that to a Windows machine that's running them now as well, but it's the same experience. You can deploy code. I can deploy code from here to that device at the office. I, you can connect to it from anyone's phone directly there. So all of our systems are capable of doing that, but, um, there's varying levels of complexity depending on the experience. And we are working on uh, a document to recommend how to do that, how to outfit your systems, especially Quantor systems to be remote lab ready, um, how to design Simulink or MATLAB or Python platforms to be able to talk over the internet from your students to the systems and some thoughts on video streaming and things like that. But um, yeah. Basically, I, I would say it's doable, but it, it's a lot of uh, a lot of unforeseen maintenance and complexity that I would caution to be aware of, at least if you're going that route. Thank you. Uh, the next group of question is touching on um, software. Does the system run in Linux? Um, the interface with MATLAB, does it need some drive or hardware interface? And the last uh, part, is there any community or place on the web to get help on how to run Python code on Cube Servo system? Okay, that's a uh, <laughs> an exciting set of questions. So uh, the first one, the, the, inter the Interactive Labs platform, um, doesn't run on Linux, as far as I know. We only build it for Windows 10, Mac OS, Android, and iOS. Um, but the actual communication, so it, it gets a little bit tricky if you start talking about virtual robotics or the virtual platforms. So the virtual platforms, you can create your code wherever you like, whether it be in, in MATLAB Simulink on Windows or in Python and Linux or things like that. and uh, you can use that code to talk to the virtual environment running in Windows um, just using an IP address. So the connection is going to be over TCP IP. So you can basically do that from anywhere to anywhere. And we have talked a little bit about options there down the road to allow it that to be a little bit more flexible. But at the moment, if you were, for instance, to use Ubuntu and write your controller code in Python, and then use our API, which is available for free. And when, once that platform is released, we'll have more information on how to gain access to that. Um, it's all available on GitHub. And uh, if you're interested, you can contact us and we'll give you some links and some information on how to, how to use that. But um, from Python in, in Ubuntu, you could use our API to be able to, to set up that connection to the virtual hardware and to send and receive the, the appropriate parameters. And, but that actual virtual platform, the virtual hardware would always have to be running on Windows 10. So basically because we're using Unreal and because of the way that we're building Unreal to sit on top of a real time simulation that's actually running 
in real time talking between your code and the virtual environment um, that is designed for at the moment Windows 10. Theoretically, that could also run in other places, but um, we're, we're not really quite there yet, especially with the Unreal visualizations um, to be able to port those either. But um, there's there's flexibility, but especially with the code. So you can develop your code essentially wherever you like, but um, and then have a connection over TCP IP to the actual virtual environment. But at the moment, that virtual environment would be on Windows 10. And for the QLabs controls that I showed, where it's the much sort of more param parametric interactions with the, the sliders and gains and plots, um, that's Windows, Mac OS, iOS, and Android. Um, uh, I think there was, may have been one other question there. Oh yeah, um, information on the web for using Python with Kubeservo 2. Um, so at the moment, the Kubeservo 2 in terms of Python is only available if you, um, I'd have to look into it. There's, there's a few different options. You can uh, create Python code on the Raspberry Pi and we have an API to let you talk to the Kubeservo 2, but I'm not entirely sure if that's public facing or not. I'd have to look into it. Um, our Hill API has been wrapped in Python, which would let you talk to the Kubeservo 2. And uh, if you contact us, we can we can give you some information on where to access that. Um, obviously, there'd be a lot of, of development there to go through in terms of building up an, uh, an infrastructure around it. But also, all of the, the Kubeservo 2 products through the embedded interface, which is part of the Qflex platform. So Qflex, I was using today, is USB. You can swap that out for an embedded interface, and then from there, you can talk to it from a Raspberry Pi or from anything else with SPI packets very easily as well. So there's some options there. I'd encourage you to probably reach out to info at quantum.com or tech at quantum.com and we can give you some resources to, to build up that platform. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, we are running out of time. So one last question and uh, then we will uh, part. So very quickly, can you comment on the cost of the platform and the subscription to the interactive labs? Yeah, so um, the, I wanna make sure I get my, my numbers correct. <laughs> um, I don't know if the, the pricing is public at the moment, um, um, but essentially the way that the licensing will work, which I can talk about, I would encourage you essentially just to reach out to info at quantum.com. Um, I, I, don't typically like talking about pricing just because I'm in engineering and I might say the wrong thing and it depends on uh, your particular circumstance. And so I would just encourage you basically to reach out to info at quantum.com and we can build a license and a solution around your particular need because a lot of it's gonna come down to how many students you have, what type of interactivity in, in terms of whether you want some customization or some flexibility in terms of large numbers of students or being able to have early access to the open platforms, all of that will come into play. And we have options for you, whether you have 10 students, 100 students, 1,000 students, and or even just yourself as an individual, and you're wanting to, to buy a license for four months or for a year, just uh, to personally use as you're giving lectures or things like that. There's a lot of options there. And so I don't wanna misspeak and give you the wrong idea. So I'd encourage you just to reach out to info.quantum.com and our sales team would be happy to, to build a solution around your particular need. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks for the, the very interesting presentation. Thanks again for joining us today. And we are looking forward to uh, seeing you online at uh, one of our upcoming webinars. Thank you. Thanks everyone.